So let's begin with uh, our first panelist uh, for today is uh, Dr. Paul um, Kitsama. Um, Paul is a senior lecturer in finance at the University of Auckland, a board member of the AI Researchers Association, so very much at the cutting edge of what I've just been talking about. Paul's academic interest is at the intersection of asset pricing and machine learning. Uh, before returning to academia, he worked in the finance industry himself, including Barclays Capital, as a derivatives trader. Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. Right, uh, first, uh, thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Um, I'll leave it to you as to whether those were interesting or not. But I think um, when it comes to chat GPT, this is a, a topic that I think is not going to leave any of you bored, right? This um, has been built as a, a revolutionary advance. And I think it is fair to say that while there's always been a little bit of hype around AI and machine learning, it kind of goes with the territory. What we are seeing is that with these large language models, of which ChatGPT is one, um, this hype is actually shared by the people that know AI, by the researchers and uh, the people that build these models. So, let's see. Right, so let's cover the basics. Um, you can quickly read through all that. Uh, so here's what you need to know. ChatGPT is a large language model. And the way that these things are built is it is a predictive model that given a sequence of tokens, and you can think of a token as roughly a word, given a sequence of words, or as, as we might call it, a sentence, it predicts the next word. Now, obviously, if it can predict the next word, it can then feed on that sequence again and, and predict the next word and so on. And so, in a sense, it's not conceptually a, a difficult thing to understand. It, it just predicts the next word and the next word, and in that sense, generates a lot of words. Um, what is important, though, is that it's using a new kind of architecture known as the transformer. So again, a, a movie reference, as if Terminator isn't enough. Um, <laughs> the transformer architecture is a different kind of neural network um, that is very powerful at a kind of modeling long-range dependencies, meaning it can model situations where you have to pay attention to something that happened a long time ago in order to make sense of what comes next. And so that's really what set the, the scene for this. And of course, I should add that these models are large. So GPT 3.5 um, is about, well, it's 175 billion parameters. We don't know how many parameters GPT-4 is. That is proprietary, but it's guessed at around 8 trillion. Um, and purportedly, uh, the training of GPT-4 cost in the order of 100 million US dollars, right? So not everybody can do this in their home. <laughs> Only a few people. OK, so let's take a step back and say there's a lot of hype. Is, is it justified? I think the thing, first thing to point out is that what is different this time around is we've always in AI and in machine learning had models that if you trained them to do something, they could end up doing it you know, reasonably well, sometimes very well. So if you train the model to play chess, it would play chess. Um, if you play, train the model to translate between English and German, it would do the translation. What we are seeing for the first time um, as researchers is that you've trained ChatGPT to just predict the next word, but you get these emergent behaviors, i.e. it now suddenly is able to do all kinds of things that it was never trained to do. It can play a game of chess. Um, GPT-4 actually plays a, you know, a reasonably good game of chess. Um, and it, it does not have a, a chess engine built in, right? It can translate fluently between any two languages. It can, if you give it an instruction, write code in multiple different computer languages. If there's a mistake in your own code, you can give it and ask it, you know, where's the mistake? And it often finds it. So these emergent behaviors is what makes a, uh, tools like uh, ChatGPT both interesting and important. So I think it is not too much to say that this is a big step toward the holy grail of artificial general intelligence, right? Uh, an AI that can do not just one thing, but can do a range of things. Okay, so if you want to uh, kind of quantify why this is a big deal, this chart is useful. Now, I apologize for the fact that it's kind of you know, not easy to read uh, what's on the axis. But you know, on, the, on the X axis, what you have are various kinds of exams, typically at the undergraduate level, right? So biology, mathematics, and so on. The blue graphs are the 
how well GPT 3.5 did. Okay? So the, the scale there is percentiles. So if you're at 0.8, that means it's doing better than 80%, not of the general population, but of exam takers, people that actually studied for this and, and think they know it. Um, and the green bars are the incremental performance that you get from GPT-4. What this is telling you is that GPT-4 has human level intelligence in a range of different disciplines. And here's the, <laughs> the interesting thing is, there's no reason why it needs to stop here, right? Human evolution is slow, but in the space of computer technology, things can move very, uh, very fast. So, you know, this, this may well be outdated in a year or two. Okay, so what does it mean for, for graduates uh, you know, and, and also for the rest of us? I think this is going to be uh, an impact on society similar to electricity, um, the computer, the internet. It really is one of those kinds of revolutions. And so one of the things we all need to do is engage with it. This is not something you just want to, to know that people are talking about it. You want to look into this yourself, become familiar with it, and be on the lookout for things that can help you. So, you know, if, if you've not signed up for your favorite large language model, you might want to do that. If you've not uh, thought about how you could use it you know, to automate some of the work that you do, you might want to think about that. Um, I should stress that this is, you know, not a silver bullet. There are still some weaknesses. One of the big ones is that these large language models are superb liars, which is to say that if they don't find the fact they were looking for, they'll make it up in a very convincing way. And for that reason, you do need to be an expert to really use these uh, uh, large language models, because otherwise you won't be able to tell when, <laughs> when you're being hoodwinked. So I think that in the end, it's going to be the people that already have some expertise that are going to find this the most useful. OK, that's it from my side. Thank you. Take a, take a seat there. Just take a seat for a moment. Great. Thanks, Paul, uh, for uh, setting the stage for us. Um, our next uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Michelle Argosy, is a principal at AQR Capital Management, based in Greenwich. Uh, she's a portfolio manager for the firm's equity uh, strategies. Um, Michelle's been a leader in research and strategy development, contributing to the advancement of the stock selection investment process. Uh, Michelle, over to you. Yeah. All right, hello, thank you everybody, and thank you for having me, especially for uh, such an interesting topic. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, our views on big data and machine learning, and in finance specifically. Uh, so, um, you know, the first thing that I wanna get across here is it, it certainly feels as though uh, big data and machine learning have exploded onto the scene, but in reality, um, these things have been around for a long time. Certainly, financial data has been ever expanding for decades, um, and not just in, in the amount of data, but the, ver the varied types of data that are out there. And machine learning itself, likewise, is built upon decades of work in computational statistics and computer science. Of course, the computer science part, quite important in terms of computational efficiency. These are as Paul mentioned, you know, involves sometimes very large language models with billions, hundreds of billions of parameters. Um, so these are, these are not new developments, rather they are an evolution of things that existed uh, before. Now, um, machine learning has had uh, massive, famous successes in a variety of areas. Um, things ranging from being able to identify pictures of cats uh, to speech recognition, you know, maybe with some varying degrees of success. I certainly find myself sometimes screaming at uh, automated uh, phone systems that, that are failing to understand me. But it is quite <laughs> impressive what, what, what has been accomplished. So, you know, pictures of cats, identifying pictures of cats, speech recognition, um, uh, applications in autonomous driving. Um, all the way back more than 25 years ago, um, uh, IBM's Deep Blue computer team uh, built AI technology that beat the world-class chess champion Kasparov, and you can see how despondent he looks in that bottom uh, middle picture. So there are plenty of quite varied examples where machine learning has been famously successful, but these all have something in common that is very different from finance, which is that they are truly big data in the sense that you can generate more outcomes as you wish. 
you can take more pictures of cats and humans and ask uh, an AI uh, uh, um, trained computer to determine what those pictures are of. You can talk more to speech recognition technology and tell it whether it's doing well or doing poorly in order to hone, hone uh, its abilities. You can drive more or, or, uh, in an autonomous um, car, or you can play more chess. These are not things that we can do in finance. Um, in finance, there is plenty of data, but, and oftentimes we think about the data in finance as being big, but really what's big are the number of potential predictors. Uh, in machine learning, what matters when you ask the question of do I have big data is do I have a large number of outcomes? And for that, it very much matters what context you're talking about. You know, if you're talking about uh, high frequency uh, trading over a multi-decade period, you have a lot of outcomes. But if you're talking about uh, investment strategies that look over the horizon of months to a year over a 20-year or 40-year period, you don't have a lot of data. That's a smaller data setting compared to identifying pictures of cats or um, beating world-class chess champions. So does that mean that um, all is lost and that big, big data and machine learning um, are not, not useful, not applicable in finance? Well, no, not at all. It's just that one has to be aware of the limitations. And the limitations are not just that the data is comparatively small. The limitation is not just that there is a lower signal to noise ratio in the sense that markets tend to be efficient. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy to beat the market. Um, the limitations also involve uh, the fact that in finance we're dealing with non-stationary processes where the, the conditions and the characteristics change over time and that makes things all the, more, all the more difficult. And then of course there's the fact that there's lots of competition that increases uh, as time goes on. So how is it that you can still use machine learning appropriately uh, in a finance context where you have smaller data. Well, you need to think about where you are on this spectrum. Um, so, you know, there's a spectrum between having no data, and certainly finance is not, even, even investment strategies over a month to year long horizon, they're not all the way to that extreme of having no data. And then on the other extreme, there's having infinite data. So let me sort of motivate for you what things become important, what things are effective, at the extremes of, the, of this spectrum, and you get a sense for how you can strike a balance and effectively use machine learning in the context of finance. So when you have infinite data, um, you have the luxury of learning entirely about relationships in a purely data-driven way, in a way where uh, you have not imposed any structure on the models. You allow, you allow the uh, machine learning to, to infer those relationships and, the, and that structure purely from the data. And there is therefore no need for judgment or theory to enter into the picture. In contrast, if you have no data, um, then theory and judgment become very important uh, in the sense that um, you, they're sort of substitutes for data, if you will. Uh, where, where you lack data, you need to impose all the more structure, uh, inject all the more theory and judgment. And of course, for financial application areas where we have data, but it's smaller in magnitude than uh, pictures of cats and autonomous driving, et cetera, we're somewhere in the middle. And so we need to marry judgment and theory with, um, uh, with using data purely to, to, to learn the structure of these relationships. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. And um, our final panellist, um, Catherine Kerner. Catherine is uh, Head of Data Analytics at the New Zealand Super Fund, uh, recent uh, migrant to New Zealand. Um, Catherine uh, had previously held positions at the Federal Reserve Board and at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, focusing on risk management and stress testing. Catherine. So I'm just going to do a quick level set for everyone. Um, if you're not familiar with the New Zealand Super Fund, you should be. We're your sovereign wealth fund. Um, if you're a New Zealand taxpayer or will re receive your pension after 2030, you should know what we're doing and how we're um, growing 
growing your money, growing the government's money. Um, data analytics here is the combination of both traditional statistical and econometric modeling, as well as advanced analy analytical modeling techniques, kind of to go to what Michelle was talking about. So wh why do we exist? We're, we're a team that exists in um, sovereign wealth funds and peer funds and private funds all over the world, but we're somewhat unique in New Zealand. So what's our purpose? Our purpose is fourfold. The first is that we foster collaboration and upskilling of the guardians of the New Zealand Superfund in data analytics, quantitative modeling. The second is to build new um, models that increase our capabilities as well as our returns, because at, at the end of the day, that's why we're here. The third is to increase inf efficiency. So for models that are, need to be automated, we improve the productivity and the processes around those. The fourth is mitigating risk. So we're building best practices um, and governance around those models. And as um, the intro said, I have been in New Zealand for about a year. Our team is new um, and we're building all these things as we speak. So it's a great time. Okay, so data analytics and investments, as, as we kind of talked about, everyone right now says they're an AI expert, particularly if, you're in, if you used to be a quantitative modeler, now you're an AI expert. So what is the hardest thing to do in quantitative modeling? My argument is it's the problem formulation and alignment with the investment goal. So. And AI, which is a very general term, there's types of AI, so large language models, machine learning, et cetera, um, are appropriate solutions for certain problems. And traditional statistical modeling and econometrics are appropriate solutions for other problems. So if you think about, as a quantitative modeler, you have a diverse model tool belt, and um, you choose the tool for the specific problem. So this is to say, like Michelle, it's, it's not gonna be the solution for all of the problems that we face in, in investments. The, this is where your eyes may glaze over because I'm gonna argue to you that the same rules that apply in traditional statistical modeling also apply in more advanced analytical modeling techniques. So that's governance. You should be able to explain your model. Um, you need to understand your assumptions and your data and your model methodology prior to making decisions on it. These are all very unglamorous parts of the job, but they're critical when, especially in our case, we have billions of assets under management and we need to know how we're going to, when we're making money, we, can't, we can explain it. And when we're not making money, we're also able to explain it. Um, so what are some of the risks about using advanced analytical techniques in investments? Um, they are more likely to be opaque. So as we kind of said, as, as uh, unexplainable results, lead to an increased likelihood of you, the user, not understanding model vulnerabilities. That's a problem. So before you use an AI model to make all of your investment decisions, you need to understand kind of those costs and benefits. The other, as a person who has thought about financial stability um, from a macroeconomic standpoint for a long time, is there's also, as we kind of look to the future, um, and as large companies race for market share in the generative AI space, there will likely be a few winners. So many of the ser services that are built on those winners will use the same AI base, and that increases the likelihood of concentration risk and hurting. So skills for the future. Um, as chat GPT and other large language models become better and better at answering questions, the important complementary human skill becomes asking questions. 
Um, asking good questions is an art form, particularly in this age. In addition to uh, what Paul said, skepticism is very important. If you just blindly put in a question into ChatGPT and you don't understand the background of the question you're asking, I would not trade on that. Um, third, the third kind of most important, I think, is um, adaptability, flexibility, that hustle, change is happening, and you need to keep up. And finally, the fourth kind of major thing on, on this slide is your ability to connect with others. At the end of the day, people need to understand what you're talking about, and so you need to win people's hearts and minds even when you're selling a model methodology. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. All right, uh, let's get into it. Uh, Paul, a big question, because it's obviously the topic du jour at the moment. Um, everyone's asking, is it going to be possible to regulate um, and control AI? Is it even going to be possible to do that? I think it's essential that we try. Um, this is a, a very powerful technology, and it's only going to become more powerful. And I think it, it would be reckless to say, well, let's just see where it goes and, and hope for the best. Um, that is not a sensible way to, to handle risk. And I'm you know, looking at the way people have been talking about this, the engagement that we're getting, I think we are getting to a place where you know, even senior policymakers realize that this is not something that can be just ignored or, or be left you know, to, to existing regulators. Um, we need to have a discussion as a society as to the kind of future that we want to live in, together with these AIs that are coming, and make sure that we are you know, on, on that track and not you know, ending up in some other place where we'd rather not be. What about the um, evolution? You know, this is, I mean, I mean, Chechi, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, Chechi is only about over six months old, and we're already talking about it like the technology has been around for, for years. Um, I mean, do, do you want to put on your future lens, future gazing lens of, of just how quickly, I mean, this is, this is going to be exponential advances from here, do you think, or do you think it, it'll, it'll go in steps? Um, I, I think what, what you're seeing is kind of incremental steps over short horizons. So what I have seen just monitoring the space and kind of engaging with the literature is um, this field is blooming. There's all kinds of people trying out new things, and it's happening quite a bit faster than, than normally in science. Science doesn't always move very quickly. And so what you're finding is you have this kind of you know, 2 or 3% growth per every 2 or 3 months. But of course, if you, if you take that over a long period of time, that becomes an exponential growth. Uh, and in addition to that, you're going to have the occasional breakthrough. And I think, you know, large language models like ChatGPT was a genuine breakthrough in AI. Um, and there might be more of those coming down the track. So I think we, we do need to plan for a world that could be very different, not in a year's time, but in 10 years' time. I was reading um, chefs, uh, it's even producing recipes that chefs are just amazed at, at, at how well thought they are. I mean, this is, that what it can do is it's just you know, quite extraordinary, really, isn't it? Yeah, so, Andrew, a lot of people were very impressed by this, um, and not only the, the, the general public that don't necessarily know the innards of it, but, you know, also leading figures in AI um, did not necessarily expect to see this. Yeah. Um, and one way of explaining this that I found useful to think about it is you can think of, of the challenge when you train an LLM is that it's trying to condense all of human knowledge you know, as scrapes from the web, Wikipedia, Twitter, <laughs> if you call that knowledge, um, and you know, all the, the books, trying to condense that into a, a very small set of data, essentially parameters. And it seems that the way in which it achieves that compression is by actually forming a model of how the world works. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's why you can ask it questions and get the kind of answers that you would expect would only be possible from somebody that understands the way the world works. Yeah. So in the future, we'll be able to sit there and chat to it at night about some topic. Um, I think and you can do that now. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it'll, it'll just keep, keep, keep talking to you and, uh, and keep feeding information as, it, as it's relevant to you. Uh, I, I've personally found in, in the work that I do that if I'm, I run into a problem, it used to be you asked a colleague and, and you asked Google, uh, and now you can ask ChatGPT. And uh, I think they're all complementary. Yeah, obviously, if, if you search on, on a search engine, you, you get all kinds of stuff, right? If you ask a colleague, if they're knowledgeable enough, you might get something more targeted. Um, what large language models gives you is kind of that in-between. Imagine a, a colleague that is extremely well-read, 
but you know, perhaps doesn't have that kind of full human ability to reason through intricate problems. Yep. Um, I, th I think that's already very valuable. Michelle, uh, how do you see this affecting the profession? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, sort of as an extension of what I was talking about, I think that it can enhance the tools that we have, but it's not going to replace human beings. Um, uh, for the reason that, that we are working in a, in a smaller data context, you're going to need to think about ways of um, shaping the approach. It, you don't have the benefit of being able to fit 138 billion parameters. So you need to decide what are you going to spend the data on? Which parameters are you going to spend your more precious data on? Because you don't have as much data as in these larger uh, you know, big data contexts. What are you going to spend the data on to fit? So, for example, in the context of uh, uh, in the context of textual processing, that might mean that you impose a, a size of a vocabulary that you're going to build, rather than allowing machine learning to determine the size of the vocabulary. In the context of building a model for future relative expected returns, that might be imposing a factor structure that you feel fairly confident, um, you know, exists, as opposed to entirely allowing. Uh, AI to, to learn what structure exists. So I think it will be um, an enhancement of tools that is not night and day different from the tools that we have currently. Uh, but, but human beings and judgment uh, and theory will still be important. Catherine, feel free to jump in on, on that. But also, how, how's, the, how's the super fund um, dealing with the AI um, chat GPT revolution? Well, in the short term, we view it as a productivity boost that we would like to take advantage of. Um, in the longer term, as we kind of, financial markets are incredibly interesting. They are so dynamic and they move so quickly and you never get bored working in them, right? So um, what we think about in the near term will be different from what we think about in the medium to long term. And that's understanding what's happening in the markets, both that kind of, um, as you may know, our portfolio is very broad. We do um, direct investing like private equity and venture capital, but also um, invest in funds and also have dynamic asset allocation, which is our strategic tilting team. So there's a lot going on that we're, we're focused on. And each of those teams and focuses will have different uses of the data and techniques that are available. Paul, a question for you from the audience. Uh, you talked about how AI will just make things up if it can't find the answer to something. How does it do that, uh, presumably not malicious? <laughs> so the technical term for this is hallucination. And what you can think of as happening here is, remember, it is at heart a predictive model. It is trying to predict plausible text that is as similar to, to things it's seen during training as, as can be. Um, so what it wants to do is create something that's plausible, not necessarily the truth. And keep in mind, it doesn't have a copy of the internet to query. Um, you know, it, it's, it's already trained. It can't go back and fact check. So it does the best that it can. And in that sense, it, it's almost a little bit human. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, if, if somebody puts you on the spot to make a decision, you, you make a decision based on the data that you have and you extrapolate. So I think, you know, it, in some sense, it's a, a very human behavior. It's not always a bad thing. Because, you know, if, for instance, we have a, a kind of uh, things that we do as humans where we, we publish lies. It's called fiction. And people pay a lot of money for fiction. They go to movies that are fictional. They enjoy it. It can be valuable. But I think the important thing is we need to understand that um, the output of the LLM is not God-given truth. It, it's simply its best attempt to make something that sounds plausible. Um, a bit like a know-it-all that's got to have an answer for everything. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> like, like some of the people we know. <laughs> um, and uh, what about the thoughts on this uh, allegedly leaked Google memo on AI, we have no moat? I mean, what, what are some of the, some of the implications for, for companies that exist at the moment? I mean, we know Microsoft has jumped on this bandwagon very quickly because they've kind of missed out on search to determine not to happen again. Um, what are be some of the, the company implications do you think this will be? So I thought that was very interesting. And, and by the way, you know, there's not universal agreement that that is in fact the case, but the, the, essential thesis there is that um, 
these large language models on first sight seems to be a game that only a few people can play. You know, how many people have a hundred million dollars to train a model and then you have to train it again next year if you want to be competitive, right? Um, what the memo is essentially saying is that whilst the big players have been creating these really huge models and, and throwing money and compute at it, uh, there's also been a kind of a, a bottoms-up um, investment in this space by hobbyists, by you know, people in academia, people at smaller firms that don't have the same resources. And what they're finding is often by being a little bit clever, you can get near the same performance as these large models, but with a fraction of the compute cost. So yeah, by buying two or $300 worth of compute, uh, you can train something that for a particular application may be just as good as some of these large models. So I think what that means is we are going to very soon be in a space where there are going to be hundreds and thousands of models, perhaps in niches, um, they're going to be evolving very quickly. So whilst there might always be one or two dominant uh, you know, general purpose models, I think we are going to see a, a blooming of kind of specialist models. Um, and, and that's a good thing because it means you can play in this space even if you are not Google. Uh, Michelle, thoughts on, on the disruptive uh, impacts of, of, of companies that are going to be particularly, uh, pati you know, perhaps um, disintermediated as a result of all of this? That, you know, what, how's this going to, it, will this level the playing field or, or, or is it going to fundamentally change the playing field? Well, I think it probably won't level the playing field to the extent that, as Paul was mentioning, not everybody has these resources. I mean, I think from our perspective, um, what's most, at AQR, what's most interesting is does this change anything about uh, the way in which companies' uh, returns are predictable or not? Um, does it change anything about the way in which we want to, or we are able to predict those future relative returns, whether, whether companies, whether, um, uh, whether making predictions at the levels of countries or other, in other asset classes? Um, again, I, I'm sure I sound like a broken record, but I don't, I don't see this as a, as, a, as a night and day revolution. I see it as something, I mean, there are, there are always changes in the world. The world is always changing um, in one way or another, uh, you know, whether through the rise of the internet, whether through the rise of the personal computer, the world is always changing. This is yet another um, chapter in that history of change. Um, Catherine, what about the implications? This is slightly outside of your your zone, but I guess the implications for um, you know universities and so forth. And Paul, you can obviously weigh in on this as well. Uh, but you know, for teaching and self learning and so forth, what, what, what do you think of some of the long term implications of where this is going to take us? Well, it's interesting. I will defer to Paul for most of this. Um, it is interesting in the U.S. There's Quantitative finance is a field, and it's a well-defined and populated field. In New Zealand, less so. Um, so the effect on the New Zealand kind of investment community may not be as different, or it, it, it may be unusual. I will say that I have small children, and I will be teaching them math and statistics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Paul? Uh, yeah, so... I think it's fair to say that this is something that is going to truly disrupt teaching in general and particularly at the, the graduate and uh, undergraduate level. So the, the reaction of, of most universities when the, this first came about is like, this is cheating, we've got to stop it, we've got to block it. And, and then uh, people realized that really the only way you can stop it is by having in-person invigilated assessment which you know, may even be on a laptop that's locked down, but you, know, you, you literally need to police people if you want to make sure they're not using it. If you're going to let people you know, take an exam offline, and you know, post-COVID that is, is not so unusual these days, um, then you really have to assume that uh, you know, you, uh, you're going to be marking somebody, well, a team of two, the, the student <laughs> and ChatGPT. Um, I think where we've ended up uh, is that there are certain places uh, and certain areas where you do want the person to have all of the skills and knowledge in their own skull. So I'm thinking, for instance, of a paramedic, right? You, you don't want the paramedic to be typing questions into chat GPT when they get to an accident. They want, you want them to know what to do and get on with it as, as soon as they can. But conversely, there are many situations where you can spend two or three hours to think through a problem or possibly a few weeks or possibly a few months. Uh, and I think in the real world, why would you not want these kinds of tools if you can? And my thinking is that we should be making sure that our students can use these tools and are good at using these tools. For, if for no other reason, they'll be competing with other people that do the same in the real world. So you know, for my assessment, I, I tell my students, you can use ChatGPT, you're encouraged, 
everybody can use it um, because that, you know, is, you know, if you're sitting on a trading desk and you have to build a new model, nobody is going to say you can't use ChatGPT to, you know, come up with a, a you know, simulation framework or the like. Um, we need to embrace these tools and make sure that uh, in education uh, we teach people the skills that they need to make AI a friend and a colleague rather than an enemy. Um, Catherine, Michelle, you, you in your presentations both uh, alluded to sort of skills of the future um, and as data analytics becomes increasingly important in finance, uh, and it, what about, you mentioned some of those specific skills, but any, anything else that you think is, is going to be moving or which of those skills would you be really honing in on at the moment? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, as I was mentioning, I think judgment, um, you know, I was at another conference recently that had some uh, similar topics and someone referred to chat GPT type technology as infinite interns, mm -hmm. um, which is apt, right? It, it only has as much knowledge and insight as the information that it was trained on. Um, and, and certainly it's able to sift through a lot of information. Um, but, you know, you, you're not necessarily going to turn the keys over to a s team of interns to uh, run a strategy or, or, or have deep insight on a topic. And I, so I think really the skills related to how to marry new tools um, with insight, with judgment, I think that's going to be essential. And that's not, that's not an easy skill, yep. knowing wh where to spend the data versus what structure to impose. These are not, these are not easy things. They come with experience. So um, if, you've, if I've ever given you career advice, this is going to sound <laughs> familiar. But each individual should think about their competitive advantage. Going back to, are you a natural storyteller or are you a numbers person? I think the unicorns are the people who can combine both of those things. Those are the very rare people. But just for either people who are starting out or looking to make a move, what is your competitive advantage? And then focusing on developing that. Because I don't think that while these will be tools that are kind of a productivity boost and will be used, that will, the market will be level. Everyone will have access to them, right? So if everyone has access to them, what is special about you that you can contribute to your career? Because ultimately, we all own our own careers. Right, and, and maybe if I could interject, sure, yeah. mm. you know, there, there's definitely a difference between using these tools in your personal life where there's maybe no intellectual property that you have to be concerned about versus yeah. using these tools, and, and, and I know you're saying the same <laughs> thing, using these tools in more of a professional setting where that maybe there is intellectual property that you want to guard. Certainly some of these companies have offered solutions where you can pay to have something that sits on your side of the firewall where you maybe can train it on the domain knowledge that's relevant for your field or your company. Um, but not everyone, not every company, not every person is gonna have those resources in order to pay for those solutions, number one. And number two, you know, at, at, um, at AQR, we're, we don't use chat GPT. We've developed some technologies that are of a similar flavor, including large language models, but not every organization is going to have, um, is going to have uh, those, um, those resources. And, you know, I, I also should say the, the, the bar is lower for what we're trying to do in terms of textual processing and trying to extract sentiment than something that both has to understand the sentiment of a question and generate text. So I don't mean to uh, give the impression that, you know, we've got a competitor <laughs> for chat GPT <laughs> under wraps that we're going to unleash next week. Uh, because ultimately, uh, if, if companies can develop uh, technology, that that's, I mean, that's clearly going to be the, the black box secret advantage if you, if you can find those sort of opportunities. But Michelle actually raises a really good point. What are large language models good at? One of the things is sentiment analysis. Are they good at, so far, predicting um, uh, what the market is going to be right. tomorrow? No, they're not. And why is that, going back to kind of Michelle's presentation, market data is really noisy, and mm. sentiment is only a piece of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. On that point, Paul, so at the moment, um, as I understand it, and I've only sort of limited usage of ChatGPT, like, like probably most people in this room, but uh, it's, it's, at the moment, it's rather um, proactive. So I'm asking it questions, and I'm, I'm you know, developing things. 
What, what about the fact that it's going to um, start sending messages to me saying you need to be thinking about this in the market and, and I'm detecting this change in sentiment and, and that sort of thing. So I'm getting this proactive stuff that it's actually you know, thinking that next level human um, proactiveness. Is that, is that coming? Well, that, <coughs> Andrew, that, that might already be happening, right? And you wouldn't know. Um, if you are getting market newsletters from different sources, are you really sure that those are human authored? Um, you can't be sure of that these days. Um, a, a lot of what you see on Twitter, uh, and increasingly a lot of what's going to be on the internet, is going to be machine generated because it is reasonably good quality. You, know, you, you really need to sit down and pay attention to write as well as ChatGPT does, and it's cheap, mm. uh, which means that it's, it's going to be flooding the information space. In terms of it being reactive, well, that's, that's a choice that you make. You, you're saying, you are my servant, uh, I'll talk to you when I feel like it, and then you'll answer. But, of course, these things have APIs. You could write code so that it proactively monitors things and then parses it and, and passes that information on. So I think taking a step back, what will need to happen to companies of all stripes is just like the internet meant that they had to re-architect the business. I think you know, over the next several years, businesses will have to reconfigure the organization to best make use of you know, effectively these unlimited and very, very cheap interns. Um, if, if you're simply trying to, to make use of it with the current structure, I think the gains are limited. But if you build a company from the ground up to, to exploit this, it, it could be very powerful. And I think that is something that is also going to affect the financial markets. I need not remind you what the impact of the internet was. I mean, we had the internet boom, right? Um, so there's every chance that we could have similar dislocations and opportunities in the future. So one, one good question, and we're starting to see examples of this already, you know, one major concern with AI advancement is the circulation of artificially generated photos and, and videos. Um, this content obviously can have huge consequences, obviously can move markets. Uh, we, we've had a couple of cases of that already, haven't we? Nothing uh, major, but enough to, uh, you know, flick the market one way or the other. Uh, how can investors in the general public uh, avoid making decisions based on false content? So I think this, this is one of the reasons why I think the, the business of education is, is not completely <laughs> over. Um, when you have credible but misleading content, those core skills that we are supposed to be teaching in universities, critical thinking, going back to sources, being careful about where you get your information from, being able to replicate findings, those become all the more important. And uh, I think everybody, you know, both in the personal life and in the professional life, needs to think carefully about where they're getting information from. And it may be a good idea to, to pay a little bit more to make sure that you're getting good quality information rather than just you know, any kind of information from people with all kinds of agenda that may not have your best interests at heart. At the moment, it's not citing references at the moment, but that has to be just a future advance of it, isn't it? <clears throat> so at the moment, well, it, it often cites references that doesn't exist. <laughs> so, so, you know, it uh, hallucinates things. But, you know, I, I use this tool on a daily basis, and recently it's been getting better when I ask it, you know, find something and give me URLs. Often those URLs are correct. So in addition, in addition to training the model, there's also what they call fine-tuning um, the model to align it with what people really want. And I think that is getting better to the extent that they are reducing the hallucination of sources. But, you know, it's, it's still not entirely safe. So the other thing that we are seeing is plugins. So tools like um, GPT now has plugins so that, you know, you can say, answer this question, but you're allowed to browse the, the internet yourself in the background to find information to inform your answer. Or you're allowed to use something like Mathematica from Wolfram Alpha. Um, you know, to do the tricky math bits. So I think we're going to see more of, of um, these language models being married with other systems that kind of accommodate their own weaknesses. You know, ChatGPT doesn't have access to the internet, but it does if you give it a search engine. It's not that good at tricky mathematics, but it is if you give it will from Alpha. And Catherine, and I just wondered if, you know, like final thoughts, just a couple of minutes, to just sort of, any, anything that you would add into the, the debate, things that are on your radar at the moment you're looking out for um, that you'd, uh, you'd like to um, share with the audience before we wrap up? Oh, wow. From what, from what perspective? From a financial stability? Yeah, from a financial perspective, yes. Um, I mean, it, it is a really interesting time in terms of uh, geopolitical risk. Um, obviously, I'm from the States, and so is Michelle. So the question in the next few days is, 
Will our government decide to? Uh, <laughs> well, they get their act together. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Will Will our politicians um, intentionally torpedo our economy? <laughs> well, we can talk about that likelihood. <laughs> yeah, certainly, certainly uppermost in everyone's minds at the moment. Exactly. Um, Michelle, any final thoughts? Well, I, I actually found the last question very interesting about dealing with um, misinformation or, or these tools being used to manipulate markets. And I think that the answer in terms of, at least from a financial context, how to protect oneself is very boring. And, so, and it's a tool that is already in our hands, which is diversification. If you build a diversified portfolio that's holding small positions in lots of different a assets, what are the chances that each one of those assets is somehow uh, the victim of misinformation at the hands of AI? Um, if you build a portfolio that is capturing dynamics, not just a small number or one systematic driver, you're, less, you're gonna be less vulnerable to that sort of thing. So thank all is not lost. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a good uh, positive <laughs> note to finish on. Um, can I thank uh, our, our panel, ask you to uh, join me in thanking uh, Paul, Catherine, and Michelle. Thank you very much for joining us today.